The second ex-wife of Rob Porter explained why she stayed with him in a blog post from April of last year. A uh, little bit of the backstory. You know, they had been married for nearly four years before divorcing back in 2013. And I want to read something for you today because this is Jennifer Willoughby's reasons. And, and forgive me as there's a little bit of language here, but this is all part of Jennifer's point. So this is what she wrote in her post. The first time he called me an effing bitch was on our honeymoon. I found out years later he had kicked his first wife on theirs. A month later, he physically prevented me from leaving the house. Less than two months after that, I filed a protective order with the police because he punched in the glass on our front door while I was locked inside. We bought a house to make up for it. Just after our one year anniversary, he pulled me naked and dripping from the shower to yell at me. Everyone loved him. People commented all the time how lucky I was. Strangers complimented him to me every time we went out, but in my home, the abuse was insidious. The threats were personal. The terror was real. And yet, I stayed. When I tried to get help, I was counseled to consider carefully how what I said might affect his career. So I kept my mouth shut and stayed. I was told, yes, he was deeply flawed, but then again, so was I. And so I worked on myself and I stayed. If he was a monster all the time, perhaps it would have been easier to leave, but he could be kind and sensitive. And so I stayed. He cried and apologized. And so I stayed. He offered to get help and even went to a few counseling sessions and therapy groups. And so I stayed. He belittled my intelligence and destroyed my confidence, and so I stayed. I felt shamed and trapped, and so I stayed. Friends and clergy didn't believe me, and so I stayed. I was pregnant, and so I stayed. I lost the pregnancy and became depressed, and so I stayed. Abuse is indifferent to education level, socioeconomic status, race, age, or gender, and no one can ever know the dynamics of another's relationship. My cycle continued for four more years. Afterward, I let go and welcomed the hard work of healing and forgiveness. My experience made me stronger and able to love more deeply, but my heart breaks for him. In the end, who is the real victim? of his choices. Let's have a conversation about this. MJ is back with me. Also here, CNN special correspondent Jamie Gangel and CNN anchor Christy Paul, an abuse survivor who wrote the book, Love Isn't Supposed to Hurt. And just Christy, let me just start with you. And I think it's just, listen, I have never been a victim. I think it's just, uh, it's difficult as a woman to read words like that and know that someone still stayed and I know you can relate. Yeah, I have people all the time telling me that they read my book and feel like I'm writing their story. And her story is essentially mine. And it's every woman who's, um, who's read it because we, all of those reasons she talked about staying, that's why we stay. Either somebody doesn't believe us. And she made a very important point. She made some very important points here. The shame and humiliation, first of all, holds you back. That's why you don't talk to people. You don't talk to people because you're ashamed that you're allowing this to happen. And then you reach out and, and somebody's not only not believing you, but maybe they're judging you for it. So this makes it really difficult. One thing she said um, in a Daily Mail piece that struck me was um, that she made a point of saying he never showed his anger to anybody else. It was something yeah. that happened behind closed doors, and that's how it works. It happens behind closed doors. You see all of it. You're afraid nobody's going to believe you. And I, I am so grateful that if all of this is true, of course, that she and her, um, his first ex-wife, they had the courage to leave because not everybody does. I've had so many people write to me and say, I didn't know I had a right to leave because when you are bombarded by somebody telling you you're worthless and you're a liar and you're selfish and you're horrible and calling you names for so long and it's somebody that is supposed to love you more than anything, 
um, it's hard not to absorb that and to have it consistently happen over and over again, it's very hard to pick yourself back up. I so appreciate you speaking up and I have uh, adored you and loved you and our friendship. Just thank you for, for, for just bringing that to this conversation. And this is, listen, this is, again, he says, no, none of this ever happened. And so we have to talk about who else knew. And Jamie Gangel, here's my question for you, because like we're reporting, right, months ago, uh, you know, the chief of staff knew that there was some issue with the security clearance, that he could get this full security clearance, um, that there was, and no action was taken. There was knowledge about these ex-wives and these allegations of abuse. Knowing what, you know, you know about John Kelly, why do you think nothing? So we don't know what Rob Porter said to John Kelly, right. assuming they had a discussion. But you can imagine he might have said, it's not true. It was an ugly divorce. That, that would have been what he told him from the get. Correct. Yeah. So the problem is John Kelly heard what he wanted to hear in that case. As someone said to me, John Kelly should have known better. And when you look at the timing of this in the fall, first of all, this is the White House. Second of all, this is a pattern of abuse here. This is not just one charge that someone might dismiss. We were, where were we this fall? We were in the middle of Me Too. Yeah. If nothing else would have raised a flag, that should have raised the flag as well. So uh, I, I think looking back, whatever Rob Porter may have, have said to him, John Kelly should have known better. I will say this. I know people who've known Rob Porter for 20, 30 years, yeah. and they cannot reconcile this with the person they know. But as his wife said, it was never in public. You know, maybe that is the case, MJ, to you, that, that, you know, Rob Porter said to the chief of staff the entire time, this isn't me, this never happened, which would perhaps begin to explain then. I mean, th th that second statement from John Kelly was shocked by, you know, the allegations. And yet, you know, as you've been reporting, the sources knew for months and months. And, you know, he, he's objected to, to Porter's decision to resign. Well, can I first say about the second statement that John Kelly released? Yeah. Yes, it started off by saying he was shocked by these new revelations, but he also said in that very same statement, he said the words, I stand by. He said that he stands by the previous statements that he had made about Rob Porter's character, even after the photo surface, even after these details came out, uh, he said that he stood by the characterizations that he had given of Porter and the man that he had known prior to these allegations. The other thing that John Kelly said in that statement was that he believes everyone has a right to defend their reputation. That to me, I was personally surprised to see that statement, uh, especially because it was supposed to be a redo. You know, we're calling it sort of the statement that John Kelly put out uh, as damage control. It doesn't actually sound like someone who is actually saying, you know what, given the seriousness uh, of these allegations, I can't mm -hmm. actually stand by the things that I've said about Porter. Uh, at least until I know the full story or have had another conversation with him, mm -hmm. uh, he's sort of complimenting him or at least supporting him for his decision to say this is a smear campaign uh, and these things didn't happen. Let me play a little bit more sound. This is from Porter's second wife. This is what she told the Washington Post about what she shared with the FBI. I told them all of the details of my marriage, um, including verbal and emotional abuse and including the incident when he pulled me out of the shower. They were also made aware of the protective order that I signed in, in June of 2010. And they were also made aware of another time when I had called the police to our home after a domestic disturbance. Christy, mm -hmm. did it really take a photo of a black eye to make people at the White House believe? Apparently it did. I, I don't think that's, the sad part of it is that I don't think that's necessarily, um, unheard of. It's, it's hard to believe, you know, as we've been saying, he had a pr public persona, he had a personal persona, um, and he, t to blame it on his ex-wife and say, oh, well, you know, I was like this, you know, to Jennifer Willoughby because my former ex-wife was who she was and it was toxic. It, it's just a classic tactic of somebody who is an abuser. And the fact is, 
Look, there are men who are abused too. I mean, we're not trying to to downplay that at all. Of course. People are, are abused, male or female. It's happening behind closed doors right now. What she went through, what I went through, it is happening to people who are possibly watching this. And if nothing else, yes, there's fear to go forward because you're afraid of the judgment. You're afraid of not being believed. You heard it there in her own statements that she was counseled by saying, well, he's flawed, but you're flawed too. And it's mm -hmm. BS at the end of the day. If you're in danger, you need to get out. It's hard to do that because you have been so broken down. But the truth of the matter is the most dangerous time for anybody who's in an, in an abusive relationship is when they try to leave because an abuser wants control and if they think they have control and now they're backed into a corner because you're walking out the door that's when things can get really violent and that's why people stay and it's time that we give a little more credence to what people say I'm not discounting the fact that some people say things that aren't true but if this is what it took maybe this is what it takes to have more of these conversations and for these two women to come out and be telling their conversation their situations now and their stories that's important because one of the hardest things about being in that situation is that you feel so alone and by hearing somebody else's story you know that you're not for one and two you know it's survivable mm -hmm. and that words matter words can shape you they can lift you up or they can tear you down and if they're coming from somebody who supposedly loves you more than anything, and that's supposed to be your safe haven, you know, that's supposed to be your safe place, we need to start giving more credence to people who have the courage to come forward. It's not easy to talk about. It's not easy to admit that you allowed yourself to live like that um, with anybody. It's hard enough to admit it to yourself, but then to admit it publicly, we just have to start listening more.